My name is Esther and I used to work as a research chemist for a glass company. It might come as a surprise to you that um, a glass company would require researchers. I worked with over a hundred research chemists and that was just in our UK facility. We also had chemists in the USA and in Germany. I guess you would be surprised because glass is, well, it's an invisible commodity. You expect to see it in your homes. You expect to see it in your cars. Increasingly, we see it as a great architectural material. And not just that, but for thousands of years, glass has existed. No um, museum uh, would have an Egyptian museum uh, display without a few Egyptian mummies and a nice little display of Egyptian glassware. And similarly, if we were to look at the ancient Babylonians, then we'd expect to see some nice little glass jugs, some nice little glass cups and perfume flasks. Interestingly, it is believed that glass was discovered by travellers who would travel through the desert and they would light fires to um, ward off wild animals to keep warm at night. And in the morning when the fire had died down, they would see glass in the bottom of the fire because glass is made by heating sand up. Theoretically, any material could be a glass. Um, in the UK, we love our chips and we like to put salt on our chips, but salt is sodium chloride and it is a crystalline material. It has a lattice. And by that, I mean that all the particles in it are arranged in a nice regular manner. And that's what gives it its crystalline, beautiful appearance. When you melt it to a liquid, you disrupt that lattice and therefore you lose that crystalline appearance. If you were able to cool it down very, very quickly, it wouldn't have time to form its lattice and would therefore be a glass. I'm going to tell you a, another really interesting fact about glass. I don't know whether that makes me very sad or just a person who needs to get a life, but I find glass really interesting. So the other thing that's interesting about glass is that it isn't actually a solid. It's actually what chemists call a supercooled liquid. You're familiar with water from the tap being a liquid and in summer you make your ice cubes and that's your solid. There is a particular temperature where you would go from the solid to the liquid. We have a melting point, similarly our liquid will freeze back to a solid. So we have a particular point where we go from liquid to solid. Glass isn't like that. The colder glass gets, the more viscous it becomes. So at about 1600 degrees Celsius, it would have the consistency of water. But by about a thousand degrees, it would be like thick treacle. And by 600 degrees, it would be to all intents and purposes, just like a solid. Uh, interestingly, and it is interesting, honestly, if you um, ever visit a Tudor house or a house from the 16th century and it has its original glass windows, if you look carefully, you will see that the glass at the bottom of the window is actually thicker than the glass at the top. I know it's surprising, isn't it? But that's because gravity has actually pulled the glass down because it isn't a solid. Glass has changed very much over the years and it requires a huge research programme because the uses of glass have changed and how we make it has changed and it's actually a really complicated process. We use glass for a range of things, not just car windscreens, not just house windows, but um, glass is responsible for the flat television TV screen revolution. Were it not for glass, 
you would not be able to have your flat screen TVs. It's also used in IT components. It's used in medicine. It's used in satellite covers. It's used in the minutest lenses. The glass has an amazing array of uses. And the process involved in making it is actually incredibly complicated. Were you to go to a glass factory, you would be surprised by the length of the factory. It would be over half a kilometer long. Um, going off on a tangent, when I went to the Italian factory, I was surprised to see the line manager traveling around the glass line on rollerblades. It's actually quite accomplished. And um, when I was in Finland, the glass manager there used a scooter. So it's a very long process. It consists of four parts, the melter, the refiner, the bath and the leer. And we're going to start looking at all of those. So the first part of the process is the melter. And guess what? That's where we melt things. <laughs> glass is made predominantly from sand. It's not special sand, it's just sand we dig up from the ground. So 70% of glass is made from sand. We add quite a lot of dolomite, we add a lot of limestone and a small amount, a pinch of carbon, which is incredibly crucial. The glass ingredients have to be heated to upwards of 1600 degrees Celsius. If you get a chance to see a glass factory, take the opportunity because it's actually really, really beautiful. If you get to look in the melter, it's white hot and it's actually hugely impressive. So we have to melt the ingredients and we have fires burning above the ingredients. We usually fire oil or we fire gas and the glass managers will be looking at the price of oil, the price of gas, and they'll be changing it on a daily basis, even an hourly basis, to make sure they're using the cheapest fuel. It's hot, there's air in there, so we are going to be making a lot of noxious fumes. We are going to be making an absolute heap of nitrogen oxides. We're going to be making a lot of sulfur oxides. We're also going to be making a lot of carbon dioxide. So we're making gases that cause acid rain and our greenhouse gases. So all of those gases will need to be cleaned before the gases are exhausted into the atmosphere. So that's what the melter does. It melts the ingredients. It also mixes it so we get a nice even mix. The next part of the process is the refiner. Now what I find really interesting is that um, a Lego brick of glass contains over a thousand bubbles, over a thousand. And to make a litre of glass, so we're talking the cartons of milk you probably buy in the supermarket, to, to make a litre of glass at 1400 degrees C will make enough gas to fill the average house. And that will all be in the glass and that all has to be refined out. All of those bubbles have to be got rid of. Nobody wants to look out of a window that's covered in bubbles. The only way we know how to get rid of bubbles is to make them bigger so that they will rise to the surface and burst. And um, my first boss was known as the Bubble King. And it wasn't unusual to see a taxi drive up to the lab and a man run out with glass samples that had just arrived from anywhere in the world. And these bubbles would be burst or smashed in a piece of kit in a, um, uh, it's called a mass spectrometer. And the gases in the bubble would be analyzed. And my boss with his years of experience could tell where exactly in the process these bubbles had come from 
what had caused the problem and how to cure it. And that's important because to keep a glass plant running costs a lot of money and you have to keep it going as a continuous process. You have to keep pulling the glass off, even if you know you can't sell it because it's full of bubbles. So it's important. So after the refiner, we're going to move into the bath. By the time the glass gets to the bath, it's about a thousand degrees. So it's got the consistency of treacle or syrup. And it's actually poured into the glass through a huge teapot spout. There's no other way to describe it. The bath consists of liquid tin metal. So you pour the glass onto the liquid metal and the glass naturally forms a pool on top of the tin that is exactly 0.4 millimetres thick. It's poured on at a thousand degrees and we pull it down and it leaves the bath at 600 degrees when it's a solid. So we don't, well, almost a solid in terms of its properties. And we don't need to worry about it um, misshaping. The, layer is, the bath is a very, very, very tricky process because the glass is floating on molten tin. And molten tin is actually very, very reactive. So if it sees air or the oxygen in the air, it will react with it to form a solid called tin oxide. And if that happened, you'd have great big lumps of solid stuck onto the glass, which obviously makes our glass unsellable. And so we have to run the bath with a mixture of gases. We have nitrogen in there and we have hydrogen in there. Nitrogen is relatively cheap and we use nitrogen because we have to have something in there and we don't want air. But hydrogen is actually quite expensive and we have to have hydrogen in there because it reacts with the oxygen, it mops up the oxygen, and therefore we don't get solid lumps sticking to our glass. And that's an area I worked in, and it's very, very interesting. All the chemical reactions that are going on and how to try and stop that oxygen getting in. So we've got our glass leaving the bath now, and it's now going into the layer. Now the layer, or the layer, is the longest part of the process. It's about 250 meters long, whilst the bath, the tin bath, is only about 40 to 70 meters long. The layer consists of a series of rollers that the glass just rolls down on, but it's not quite as straightforward as that because the glass has to cool in a certain way. If the glass cools too quickly, you run the risk of a slight vibration causing it to spontaneously explode and no one wants exploding glass windows. So it has to be cooled in a certain way so you get certain tensions in the glass which means it won't explode but you are still able to cut it into the shapes and sizes you want. The layer is also important because it's where we can add special coatings to our glass. You may be familiar with K-glass. I'm not sure if um, Paris and Brussels are as cold as the UK, but we, um, we struggle in our winters here. And we have K-glass because K-glass has this special coating that reflects the heat back into the room. So you don't lose heat through the window. And that was actually invented by my boss, Ed Hargreaves. So the coating is added to the glass in the layer. We can also decorate the glass by adding artwork or decorative stamps, and, and that has uses as well. So that will all happen in the layer. The glass will then be cut, transported, and made into, well, whatever, car windscreens, the lot. So I worked on the tin bath, but I also worked on other parts. I was part of a team that designed glass for use in satellites. 
And I was also part of the team that designed glass for a well-known car manufacturer. It was decided that car buyers would prefer to have tinted windscreens. This had lots of benefits, gave a little bit of privacy to the driver, but more importantly to the car manufacturer, it would reflect UV light. So UV light from the sun couldn't get into the car. That would keep the driver cooler. But more importantly for the car manufacturer, it would stop the, uh, I'm going to call it furnishings, but the seat materials, the dashboard materials, it would stop them degradating. You know yourself, when you have something that's getting sunlight a lot, it fades and the material starts to lose its flexibility. The same with cars. So we designed a glass that would absorb all the UV light so that the car um, interior could be made of cheaper, manu um, cheaper materials. Okay, well, I hope you find glass making as fascinating as I do and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for listening to me.